Hello, Brooks here. Welcome to Books with Brooks. This is our May book club meeting. This month we read The New One, Painfully True Stories from a Reluctant Dad by Mike Berbiglia, which I feel I will never tire of saying Berbiglia. Berbiglia, Berbiglia, Berbiglia. It's a really fun name to say. And Mike Berbiglia is a stand-up comedian. If you're not familiar with him, he has several Netflix specials. He has written another book called Sleepwalk With Me. He's a very funny guy. Um, We picked this book this month because people wanted something funny and a little bit lighter. Although I actually thought this book was a little bit more heavy than I expected it to be at some points. Um, But I am very, very excited to have my friend Carrie here with me today. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Carrie, you are, uh, you have a new one yourself, don't you? A new little Beeb. Congratulations. Thank you. Baby is um, six weeks as of yesterday. Six weeks. He's so teeny tiny. I just got to hold him for the first time. It was thrilling for both of us, I'm sure. (laughs) Um, So I'm really interested to hear your thoughts. I am a childless person. Um, and you are a new mom, um, married to a new dad who maybe identifies a little bit with (laughs) some of these Mike Berbiglia, um, little stories and vignettes and points of view. Uh, so it's, you have an amazing perspective to bring to this conversation. So thank you so much. Oh no. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. So we always start out, well, I guess we should start out with a quick, I usually say plot synopsis, but I don't know if that's appropriate here because this isn't really like a story from start to finish with a beginning middle and end it's more like a series of short stories that tell one longer story kind of about his new dadness so why don't we tell people a little bit more about like what this book is about yeah so um you briefly touched on it mike Berbiglia. I honestly did not know how to pronounce his last name at first. So I'm glad that you said it. I could have just sounded it out, but it looked really lengthy. Um, so he is a comedian. He marries the love of his life, Jen. And they have kind of this very seemingly down to earth, you know, very honest relationship with each other. They have decided to not have children Um, They talk about why they don't want to have children. They have a very special relationship where they share a lot of inside jokes together that Mike very much um, thinks is very special and doesn't want to lose. And then um, his wife decides or, you know, has a conversation where she opens up that she kind of does want to have a kid and they talk about it. Ultimately, Mike um, still doesn't want to have children as was clear from the beginning of their marriage, but he um, wants to make his wife happy and he is very much, um, you know, dedicated to his wife's um, content satisfaction in the relationship, it seems. And so they do have a daughter named Una. And then he goes on to talk about, you know, the different challenges that came with being a new father, all of the things he learned, what was hard, um, what surprised him. And then there are just a lot of funny moments, as you said, um, of realization from Mike's perspective. And there are some other moments where he, you know, is just very honest, I think, about some fears that, you know, people may have when they're thinking about being parents or when they first become parents or moments of doubt or just not sure of, you know, what to do. And Mm -hmm. so I I would say that's like really the whole story of the book, but there are a lot of um, interjected moments of um, comedy and and a lot of stories that Mike tells really well. That was a really great synopsis, Carrie. Good work. Thank you. Thank that was beautiful. You. Yeah. And if if anyone is, has read Sleepwalk with me, it's um also worth picking up. And he tells this incredible story that I think is pretty famous. I, I want to say he like read it on the moth or something, because I've definitely heard him tell it somewhere, but it's this he has a sleepwalking disorder and he once jumped out of a window of a second story window at a hotel he was staying at in like Wisconsin and he almost died but luckily he didn't and like he then so he jumps out this window and like wakes up when he hits the ground and then he's like bloody and covered in glass and he has to go inside to the like front desk and be like oops I jumped out the window like can you please call an ambulance (laughs) 
so now he like takes clonopin to sleep and sleeps inside of a sleeping bag zipped up all the way with um like oven mitts Mittens. on so that yeah. he can't unzip the sleeping bag uh, it's like very funny but it's also like horrible <laughs> But can you imagine? No, I you know you fly out the window. You'd have to walk in and be like, I don't have my room key. I swear yeah. I'm staying here. I have nothing. Right. On and me. they like, didn't, they were like, who are you? Like what's happened? Like, and then I'm sure they didn't believe him that he like sleepwalk. I mean, it's all very suspicious, but yeah. Um, yeah. His is diagnosed sleep disorder. He writes in this book about the like what does he call it? His like fitted sheet that he, mm -hmm. so, he'll, so he'll like lay down on the bed and then he'll put a fitted sheet over himself and the mattress and it has a hole cut out <laughs> for his head. So he sleeps like under a fitted sheet. Yep. I wish there was a picture of it included. Actually, I would like to see how that like looks. <laughs> yeah. Very silly. But yeah, it's sort of, yeah, it's like musings on being, I think, I think for me, this is really descriptive, a reluctant dad. Mm -hmm. Like that really, that really describes him. So first question, Carrie, did you like the book? I did like the book. Um, I thought the premise was very honest and obviously being a new parent myself, I found a lot of the things he spoke about to be pretty relatable. Um, also a lot of his stories were very funny um, sometimes they kind of went down a different track than the premise of, you know, being a new dad. But I had never actually heard of um, Mike Berbiglia before. I had never heard any of his material. So to me, I thought it was very funny and um, it was very lighthearted and just an easy read to get through too. Yeah, it was definitely fast. Well, mm -hmm. and we haven't touched on, oh, I think you mentioned it, but it's um, his stories are interspersed with poetry from his wife. Oh, right that are written from like the same time like she was writing poetry all through this like early parenthood and pregnancy experience so they used the poetry that she wrote and they like interspersed it with his stories which I thought mm -hmm. which I thought was really cool I mean I didn't I'm gonna be honest I, I didn't get or like all of the poems but I think that's kind of like par for the course with poetry <laughs> yeah um in my limited poetry knowledge um but I thought it added like a really kind of it broke the stories up it added a different perspective um to the mm -hmm. book because you kind of got to hear his wife's voice a little bit although in my opinion not enough like I would actually love to hear her give an interview about some of these things I because agree. and then this is part of the honesty of the book right but like he doesn't come off well mm -hmm. he comes across like a like a shitty dad <laughs> and a shitty husband through a lot of this book yeah and I think you know it's self-deprecating humor but I also like am kind of worried about her <laughs> I know I I feel like, like I hope she's okay yes I feel like he came off very selfish um and it, you know it's tough because I think he explained a lot of the things personally that he dealt with, you know, from the sleepwalking, the sleepwalking disorder to, you know, not the best physical health. And, you know, he struggled with, you know, making sure that his life was on track. And, you know, how do you translate that into making sure that a child's life is on track? And I, I think he had a lot of self-doubt. Um, at the same time, I feel like he did, he, he was trying, you know, he, he really wanted to be there for his wife. I think he just didn't know how. Um, but I totally agree. Yeah. I would love to hear from his wife. I don't think we ever will because he says that she's an extremely, an extremely private person. Um, but I would be just right. very interested in what she thought. I mean, she was there for like, you know, all, all, all or most of these moments, but like, what would be her perspective from um, the things that he said? Yeah. I, I wonder that too. And I do think I actually watched like a group zoom because this book came out during COVID so it came out like last May or something so they did a like virtual book tour from what mm -hmm. I can tell so there are some interviews with him online they're mostly just with him and then I watched one that she was part of and I was like oh cool I'm gonna get to hear Jen talk but then she like didn't talk <laughs> And to be fair, I didn't watch the entire thing, which was like an hour long. Um, but she, the like first 20 minutes of it, like nothing from her. I wonder, 
<laughs> so I kind of gave up. What she looks like. I'm going to have to look up a picture of them. She's super pretty. She's really pretty. Really? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's super pretty. Um, and she has her own book of poetry that I can't remember the name of right now. I can look it up. Um, but yeah, she seems like a really smart, like interesting person, like alongside Mike Birbiglia. Their child is going to be so creative. Yeah, like what a creative power couple for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can't find it, but her book, she does have a book of poetry and I can't find the name of it. I also am really interested in listening to this book on audiobook Mm. because I know he reads it and I think hearing it in his voice would be really fun and like getting his timing and his delivery because he's a stand-up, like he's a comedian I'm sure hearing it brings these jokes to life in a totally new way. And I actually did think at certain points like that I was reading too quickly and that I wasn't like giving the jokes breathing room. I, yeah, I feel the same way. So I just watched some of the Netflix special. Oh, did you? I want to watch it. Yeah. And a lot of the um, jokes that he tells on the Netflix special are straight like from the book. Yeah. Or I should say the book is straight. You know, I don't remember which one came first, but I think the he, Netflix special came first, actually. Oh, okay. Which so seems the, weird. Then I should say the book is, you know, some of it is verbatim. Um, and since I had never heard of Mike Birbiglia before this, you know, I read the book just kind of in my own head. Yeah. And it was, I agree, I, I read it quicker than the way he speaks. Yeah. And I actually found that I liked it a little better because some of his jokes. Like, I'm trying to think of one in particular. He was talking about his couch and how expensive they are. And he's like at the couch store and he's like, how much is this couch? And they're like, a thousand dollars. And he's like, is it on sale? Or are you having a sale? And they're like, it is on sale. It's like, are you going to ever go out of business? And they're like, we are going out of business. And when I read this in my head quickly, I don't know, it was very like funny. I'm imagining this conversation back and forth. And then in the Netflix special, actually hearing his delivery it is slower. It is very different. So it was kind of funny to see both of them side by side. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think I would like to watch it. I'm going to put it on my list. Um, and for mm-hmm. everyone listening, it, it's called The New One, the Netflix special. And it's obviously on Netflix. So you can check it out. I don't know. Carrie, do you know how long it is? It's like an hour. I think it was like an hour and 20 minutes, somewhere around then. Okay. So add that to your watch list. Click, click. Subscribe, subscribe. <laughs> What are the major themes of this book? Oh, I think, I mean, family is probably the, the main one, you yeah. know, family dynamics, um, change. Mm-hmm. Change for Cause sure. Because I would say their relationship changes a lot. I don't know. I feel like there's a, a, there's a lot of emotion that I didn't see initially until the book kind of got going and especially from the middle to the end. But there's a lot of, you know, fear and doubt, insecurity, you know, self-reflection. Jealousy. I don't know what you would call that. She's yeah, always saying, jealous. Jen's yeah, always that. saying you're jealous of Una. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's like the first reason why he ever started jotting down these notes of funny stories about the relationship in Una, because someone, I forget how mentions jealousy. And so that's how he thinks about them. But yeah, a lot of, you know, actually very kind of, I mean, not heavy, but significant emotional um, themes as well. Coming up after the break, we talk about what we thought of Mike Birbiglia as a husband and a father. Want to hear more about your favorite TV shows and movies that are on countless streaming services? Then listen to Up Next with your new favorite hosts, me, Kristen Aviles. And me, Christina Walter. Every other week, we'll highlight one genre, but two movies or TV shows, one old and one new. We'll let you know what's hot and what's not from your favorite or least favorite streaming services. And be sure to stay tuned to the end of each episode where we shout out an artist whose name you should know for their talent in the industry. So follow us to stay up to date with your favorite hosts from Up Next, a part of the Press Play Podcast Network. So our first sentence is, hold please. In June of 2016, my wife Jen and I took our 14-month-old daughter Una to the Nantucket Film Festival. And the the title of this chapter is, The Book Starts Here. (laughs) In case you weren't sure. Uh, What do you think about that opening sentence? I liked it. I was like, first off, this is, oh, this is cool. Like, this kid's getting to go to, you know, a film festival 
um I mean also the title really kind of sets you up for you know what to expect in regards to the basic you know thought process of the um, author or you know Mike Berbiglia and I just thought it was really interesting it kind of starts you off right on a story like I already feel like he's about to tell me a story yeah and you're right it does jump right into the jealousy thing it says when the festival director picked us up at the Nantucket airport which was basically someone's backyard with planes in it she asked if I would tell a story at the festival's storytelling that night she said the Mm -hmm. theme is jealousy I said I don't think I want to tell a story Jen said (laughs) you're jealous of Una you should talk about that so that's sort of like where we jump in to his parenting of like you're jealous of your kid which I think on the surface it's like that's kind of messed up right like you want to be judgmental of him for that like you're gonna be jealous of a baby like really but I think Mm -hmm. it's like I think probably if a lot of people evaluated like their interpersonal relationships they would notice jealousy in a lot of them um Mm -hmm. so maybe that's really fair and honest and like very valid I think it is I think it is very fair I mean I'm only six weeks in and there have been moments where like I am you know like Jeff and I are having a conversation or we're doing something together and Thomas cries out and like I'll I'll go to him or Jeff will go to him and like even this morning I thought oh like my attention is very immediately shifted like right. I know as it's as for cries. yeah it's for like something that we both you know share but I, I totally understand how jealousy can happen yeah I mean, I feel like I'm jealous of babies all the time. First of all, babies have the best (laughs) clothes. Every time I see a baby's outfit, I'm like, I want that outfit. I want to put it on my body. May I please have that onesie? Like babies get to be swaddled. They get to be carried around. They don't have to have jobs. They get to cry whenever they want. They eat so much. (laughs) Yeah. Eat, eat all the time. Like someone constantly feeds you. Like, please, can we all just be babies? It's like wildly ironic that they're so unaware of how good they have it. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) And they're going to fight you about it. Like babies. Oh man. I actually remember thinking in like kindergarten when we had nap time, like, or it was probably preschool. I don't think it was kindergarten. Thinking like, I'm going to miss this later. (laughs) That is very aware of you to think at such a young age. I don't know. Maybe my parents would disagree, but since I've had conscious memory I have loved taking naps so so sweet I might just be a nap lover as a person took one today proud to say fitted in between meetings (laughs) was not a long one but that's okay (laughs) wow we got really sidetracked but naps are awesome I guess is the point of the story exactly and babies are ungrateful (laughs) and babies are ungrateful and they don't deserve to be babies so fine (laughs) you get a job baby yeah contribute um so wait did you say what do you think of the poetry what was your opinion I um I am also not a connoisseur or even a well-versed person I get the pun um not a well-versed person (laughs) in poetry yeah but um I think there were a couple poems that I thought were kind of sweet because they were so relatable at the time just being a new mom and being so engrossed in you know feeding your child and that kind of intimate bond that you feel. Um, at the same time, I think some of it was very introspective in a way that I didn't fully understand, but I found some of it quirky. So like, I, I agree, I think it broke up the book into a good rhythm between Mike's stories, um, but some were kind of over my head and I felt were extremely private. Like yes. she was writing something that was like very much like, I don't know, like deep within her. And I almost couldn't, like, I don't know her. So I can't like connect to it. Yeah, I agree. I felt like some of them were so like intimate that I was embarrassed. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, she talks a lot about um, breastfeeding and like Mm -hmm. feeding her child and like providing. She, I think at one point she talks about how when she's stopping her breastfeeding because her daughter is at a, a certain age she's like really sad by it. And she's like freaked out. She's like, if I don't, you know, provide the food for my child, like what if something happens and the world ends and grocery stores, you know, are no longer in existence. And I'm the sole provider of nutrition for my child. I don't know. It's very interesting to hear her thoughts. Yeah. Which I've never thought about breastfeeding that way. 
And it actually, as a very frugal person, I was like, oh shit, like she's yeah. right. Like breastfeeding is cheap. It's cheap as heck. You've always got it on you. Like you yeah. don't have to buy anything. Like I never thought about it that way. And that's like a cool way to think of it. <laughs> yes. I, it's, it's so, it's very interesting. I don't know. It's like very, it's very like primal. Yeah. Primal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Like you're a mammal. Exactly. Big time. Yeah. Okay. There was this part. Um, it's the very start of chapter three that I really liked. And it says, I'm not ready to teach the children. I've read hundreds of books. I've retained very little. In third grade, they taught us photosynthesis. And I thought, this is not going to stick. It hasn't. <laughs> Because I feel like I had moments like that. I'm sure we all did in school growing up where it was like, okay, I'm going to learn this for the test, but like, this isn't going into long-term. Like I, I won't know this next year or in 10 years. Like, absolutely not. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. It'd be like, okay, so when is the test? I need to just know it by then. Oh, right. and hopefully the chapters didn't like, um, build off one another, but right. <laughs> if you did, if they did, you're screwed. You were screwed. So I really thought that was very relatable because I feel like I had those thoughts in school too. Like, just like, you know what? No, this, this one's not going to be for me. Thanks. Thanks again. Right. Especially a lot of um, biology or chemistry or even like a lot of math equations. I, yeah, I am horrible at all of those subjects now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But like doing my taxes, like I can do that. Okay, I can too by paying someone else to do it. Oh, right. I mean, by paying my taxes, like sending all the forms and knowing that's which right. ones keep, are relevant. That's what you need to be taught in school, how to keep track of forms, which frankly right. is an art and does take a lot of work. Yeah, or like how to be organized, like make folders, label them, all of 2020 stuff put in one place, you know, like just mm -hmm. comes off as common sense, but I feel like a lot of people get kind of screwed no I feel like you don't learn that until you don't do it and then you're like oh no right <laughs> like yeah it takes like royally messing it up to like learn that lesson which right. is unnecessary someone exactly. can just tell you it could be home ec the new home ec they should do that I mean why aren't children taught like practical life skills in school I don't know I feel like I mean women used to be taught how to how to cook and do stuff like that that was more practical than not learning that although I mean I feel like that's a bit sexist if like guys get oh, woodworking yeah. and girls certainly get cooking everyone. class but yeah. like we should still have a class like not you know separated like that but a class where you learn basic life skills yeah I know I wonder if that exists <laughs> I don't know like how do they so use a swiffer I've been in school here's how to use a swiffer wet wet jet I was like Jeff how do you attach it <laughs> don't forget to charge your Roomba exactly yeah okay um I read an interview <laughs> what I said we're way off track <laughs> oh I know yeah we keep, <laughs> keep getting off track you know what I think Mike Burbiglia would he would be here for it because I feel like he gets off track a lot too and I, yeah I like that yes um I read an interview with um Mike Birbiglia, where he describes this book as the opposite of a parenting manual it's literally what not to do and, and I asked if people agreed with that at book club and they kind of didn't. And I don't think I do either. I mean, I understand why he's trying to like sum it up in this QC way, but it's not really, it's, it's not really a parenting manual, but it's also not, not a parenting manual. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of the stuff, um, it, I could see that it is a parenting manual. If you haven't had kids yet, um, if you're thinking about having kids, like maybe this is a good book to read. It's a very interesting perspective and it's very honest. If you already have kids, like, I don't think it's that helpful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oops, you've already done it. Yeah. Like if you've already done it, you'll probably do better than Mike Birbiglia. <laughs> yeah. So don't read his book. <laughs> but I do feel like, um, I mean, I, I feel like there is this weird, um, 
this weird cult about having kids where it's like, yeah, it sucks and it's so hard, but it's the best thing I've ever done. And like, you need to do it too. Like Mm -hmm. that, that's the message you get over and over again. And like, oh, you'll feel differently about your own kids. Like people tell you that all the time. And listen, I'm sure that's true because of biology. Like you physically have to feel differently about your own children. Mm -hmm. But I liked, I really appreciated this book because it wasn't like a magic switch flipped with him. And he suddenly, like, his daughter was born and, like, everything was amazing. Like, it, it was, continued to be really hard. He, consti- he continued to feel really conflicted. Like, I, people don't talk about that. And I'm sure mm-hmm. that that is a really common, apparently, uh, you know, especially for people who, like, aren't on purpose having kids or, like, I, I just think it's probably way more common than we, like, let ourselves talk about. Yeah, I, I think that it's common for... I think maybe more for the dads, but I have heard that it happens with the moms too, where you don't like immediately connect with your child. Um, yeah. And I, I don't know, like when he talked about some of the pressure that he felt or when people made comments like, you should totally do this. I really was like, oh, like, so it, it really irks me when people say that. Cause I'm like, no, like I would never tell someone to do that. I don't personally want to feel responsible for you making the choice that you didn't want to make maybe. And then like, would you resent me for it? Like (laughs) I would never want that type of, uh, I don't know, onus on myself. You know, like if you want to have kids, like all for it. If you don't like totally amazing, you should, you know, make everyone should make their own decisions. Um, I'm hoping that that thought kind of dies out that you like should have kids and like, I did it. Therefore you should do it. And it's great. And you don't know. And it's like, well, I mean, you know, do you know more than that person knows about themselves? I don't, you know, I beg to differ. I kind of think that everyone knows themselves best. So if you don't, you know, like if you don't think it's for you, like it probably isn't for you or, and, and maybe people are surprised at times, which is great, but like, maybe not. Yeah. Well, I also think unfortunately in our society, like what your experience with having children is like is so socioeconomically dependent. Mm -hmm. Like if you can afford daycare, if you can afford help, if you can afford, like, you know, if you can afford Mm -hmm. these resources, then like, it's going to be a lot easier for you. Mm -hmm. But if you're like a single working mom balancing it all and like, it's going to be really hard. I mean, I just think like the way that our society is structured means like, if you don't have access to like pretty immense resources, like having a kid is really, really hard. Right. And kind of even more so to support the reason, like if you don't really want to have one, like maybe don't, you know, like it's okay not to, because yeah, it's going to be hard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think similarly, I know we talked about this at book club, but it's always fun to read about like glamour jobs, Mm -hmm. like his, you know, he's a stand-up, he's like a traveling stand-up comedian. He's like a famous comedian. Like, I mean, that's the definition of a glamour job. But then when you read about like what his job really is, it sucks. He's like driving to Des Moines to perform for drunk college students for one hour, like (laughs) then staying in a La Quinta that he jumps out the window of like, (laughs) it's, um, you know, I mean, I'm sure there are amazing moments where he goes and like Jimmy Kimmel or he goes to the Oscars or stuff. But I think like mostly his job is like driving to obscure places to do like small shows. Right. And then when and then when you start talking about having a family, then how does that like he's going to be on the road for 120 cities like without his family? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> That's really hard to balance. Yeah. And so that was one of the main things between Mike and his wife is they kind of said like, yes, let's, okay, we decide we will have a child together, but we'll try to not have our lives change. And the fact that Mike has to be on the road so much is kind of a big factor, especially in the beginning, because he feels guilty, like he's away from his wife and his daughter. But she's like, well, we said that we would never like change anything. We wouldn't hold each other back. But then in reality, it's, I don't know, it feels like the the dynamic becomes really complicated because they set out to do one thing, but the reality of the situation and how much their daughter demands of like their attention and time. It, I don't know. It's, it, it was almost like naive to think that they, that nothing yeah. could change Definitely. or nothing would change. Yeah. Very naive. I mean, optimistic, I think in a cute way. Yeah. True. Optimistic. But 
Yeah, I mean, especially if you have a child, like they, it sounds like their kid, like didn't sleep well, like not a good sleeper. Like that really is disruptive to everyone. Mm -hmm. Like, and yeah, I mean, it's just really, your life changes. (laughs) Right. You can't not change. Right. Right. Exactly. If you have a kid. So, yeah. I mean, so what did we think, like, overall of Mike Birbiglia as a husband and as a father? Oh, I think this is a really hard question because there's a part of me that really feels for him and that, you know, he didn't really connect with his daughter. He really missed his wife. He missed their relationship before their child. He was reluctant to begin with. And I feel like there were a lot of things that kind of, you know, stacked against him. But at the same time, I him to um I don't know I wanted him to step up to the plate a little bit more um he just really in my opinion like didn't really know how and there's I think no manual for like a new dad and you know he tried his best but at the same time for me personally it was a little frustrating how sometimes self-deprecating he was and unable to you know, kind of man up and like get over his own doubts or insecurities, like for the sake of helping his wife. Yeah, I think I agree. I mean, I don't feel that I'm super empathetic, like in general, but I, yeah, I really like, I felt he came off really like whiny and unhelpful. And like his, his analogy that like, I'm the intern of my family, like, oh, boohoo me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, you're not, man. Like you are her partner and husband and Mm -hmm. and you're someone's father like you're not an intern like that's an excuse you're making so you can be shitty yeah stuff like he was very much still focused on himself yeah it seems like it I actually read um the New York Times review of this book when it must have been when it first came out And I think the line that like really sticks out to a lot of people is when he's like, I see now why dads leave. (laughs) And it's like, whoa, that's a punch to the gut. Yeah. And this, I don't remember who it was, but this New York Times review was like, (laughs) maybe in, um, you know, in countering that point, I now see why dads leave. It's like, I see why women divorce their husbands or Uh, I see why women divorce the dads. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I, that's what I kept thinking through all this too. I'm like, oh my God, like this poor woman, like, yeah, how is she putting up with him? Like she has a baby and she has another baby. Yes. That's a good way to put it. And then it. he keeps being like, I think we need to go to dinner. Me, me, me. And like, well, she can't go to dinner, dude, because you don't help her with anything and she's exhausted and your kid won't stop crying. Like, right. I just, yeah, I didn't have a lot of empathy for his struggles, I guess. Cause I, I just felt like hers were so much greater. <laughs> right. Yeah. Hers were so much greater, but then I, I don't know. I think this is a really tough question. Cause like, yeah, her struggles were so much bigger, but that doesn't like invalidate his struggle at the same time. So I think that there are times where I was like, Jen, you can like explain this a little bit better to help him. He's like clueless and doesn't yeah. know anything. It's like, I felt like she could have sometimes, I mean, granted, it's not really her job to like explain and like handhold him in these things because like, I don't know, I think it's very common for society to be like, well, you're the woman. So you're the nurturing one. Like you just know how to do this and it's all natural. And I'm like, is it? I don't think for everyone, like women still have to work at it and we have to learn and maybe we spend way more time, although that's not necessarily the case, but Maybe at other times, women were the ones that spent more time with the child, so they, like, knew more. Um, But anyway, like, I don't think Jen was, like, this magic person that just knew everything. She just, you know, spent more time with her daughter. But she could have, like, finessed it maybe a little bit sometimes with Mike to help him understand. Because he just seemed like like he was drowning. I mean, I I hope he's in therapy. (laughs) (laughs) I hope so. I hope he's talking to someone about this because it seems like he needs it. I think so Um, too. And it's a lot. I mean, I'm sure it's a lot. Like he has a really weird job that's very intense, I'm sure. And like very vulnerable. And like, then you have a kid you don't really want. I mean, listen, like it's tough. Sure. Mm -hmm. But you sort of like made your bed. Like 
I don't know. Yeah. I made your weird sleepwalking bed. Like now go lie in it, please. <laughs> Stop complaining. Very true. Yes. But I wonder too, if that's a little bit of like, sh- what's the term? Scheidenfreude. Is oh, that right? I don't think I know Wait. that term. I don't know if I'm using that right. But basically like it's, I don't think that's the right term, but what I'm trying to convey is it's hard to feel bad for rich, famous people. Mm. And we talked about this with, um, another book which one was it oh it was the David Sedaris book and it was just like Mm -hmm. this guy didn't come across as like cute and funny came across as like whiny and mean yeah and I don't think that that is really the the case here I don't think they're the same but it is the same for me of like okay he's this famous comedian who gets to produce Broadway hit shows and Netflix specials I'm so sorry your life is so hard, Mike Berbiglia. Right. You know, like, it's a little bit of, like, it's hard to give him that rope. Yes. It is hard to be sympathetic with him at some points, definitely. I also think, um, speaking for myself personally, I'm someone that, like, you know, feels prideful about, like, overcoming obstacles and, like, figuring stuff out on my own. So to see him, you know, just so helpless and, you know, unable to you know, push ahead or like learn or just, you know, suck it up is really frustrating. And yeah, it's, yeah, I don't feel that bad for him in that way. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's funny and it's really fun to read about. I mean, you know, it's fun to like peek behind the curtain and this kind of a memoir, you know, short story series, like autobiography, um, little book. So yeah, I really liked it. I'm not sure if I said that. I also really liked it. I really enjoyed it. The part about the cats made me cry, oh. which I didn't expect to cry in this book, which is supposed to be funny, but it was so sweet and heartfelt. Yeah. About they, when they lose their cats. Also, and I have a cat, so I just feel like that was near and dear to my little heart. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I liked it. I liked it too. I already said cool. that. You already said that. Thanks for saying it again. Well, I'm going to go watch the Netflix special. Maybe I'll make Jake watch it. You should make Jeff watch it and see if he like really laughs at any of the jokes, the dad jokes. I'll let you know. Okay. That sounds good. Well, Carrie, thank you so much for being here. It is always such a pleasure to talk to you about books and about life and anything at all. Um, This uh, this will be coming out um, tomorrow. So we are recording this on Thursday. Yeah, people will be listening on Friday. What a quick turnaround. <laughs> Very quick. Amazing. Thank and you I for still need to pick me. our June book. So stay tuned for that info at a later date. Can't wait. Can't wait. Thanks so much, Carrie. Thanks, Brooks. I'll talk to you soon. Books with Brooks is produced by Mo Barrow with theme music by Jonathan Allen. Books with Brooks is part of the Press Play Podcast Network, which empowers hosts to create high quality professional shows that inspire and entertain. If you've been dreaming of hosting your own podcast, we can help. Please email content at pressplaypodcast.com to get started today. Please be sure to subscribe to get the latest episodes wherever you listen to podcasts.